16 and 15. Matthew 6, 14 and 15. It says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now flip to Matthew chapter 18 and verse 21. Matthew 18, 21. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times but up to 70 times 7. Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison until he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Let's pray again. Father, please help us this morning. Please give us grace that we can understand and live out this prayer request. Father, we pray that you will give us that understanding that will, it, that will filter down into our whole lives and how we function every day with people that are around us. Give us grace that we might daily seek forgiveness from you and extend forgiveness to others. Help us now as we study this out and lead us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. We live in a world in which there are billion people, 
four billion people. And those people are created in the image of God, and they have a great dignity about them because they're created in the image of God. And those people are also sinners. They're warped, twisted, distorted. We all are. So imagine we live on this little globe with four billion of us sinners all around here. And you and I interact with them and we are them. We interact with them every single day. We're rubbing shoulders with sinners every day. And we are sinners. We rub shoulders with them at home, at work, on the street, when we're driving. We meet and see hundreds of them throughout the week as it goes by. And inevitably, with all of these sinners on this tight, tightly packed into this little globe, inevitably we're going to sin against each other. We're going to hurt one another. We're going to say things that are wrong and that scar. We're going to do things that are wrong. We're going to offend, belittle, rip off, abuse. And we're going to have all of that happen to us. Then some of us actually decide to marry others' sinners and try to live an entire rest of our lives with this other sinner. And we're going to do things that hurt each other in that close, compact relationship, which is marriage. Then, of course, we have children. And children, parents, sin against their children. And children sin against their parents. And children sin against each other. And then we join churches. And churches are filled with sinners. And we sin against each other. And we offend one another. And then all of us daily in all of this sin, sin against God. Therefore, the issue of forgiveness is a huge issue. And it's a multifaceted issue as well. If you and I do not get forgiveness from God, for instance, this is how huge the issue is. If you and I don't get forgiveness from God, we will be punished, and that punishment will be for eternity. But secondly, if we do not forgive our fellow human beings, we will not only be miserable, but there will be serious repercussions from God if we don't forgive our fellow human beings. Now, Jesus has taught us to pray a daily prayer about forgiveness. A little simple prayer. You've probably memorized it like this. Forgive us our debts or our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us or as we forgive our debtors. Jesus has taught us to pray this prayer every single day. Now, this little prayer has confused a lot of people. And actually, believe it or not, it's very controversial. And that's what we want to do this morning. We want to just study the controversies that are around this this morning. And then this evening, we're going to take up a sort of extended application on the various dynamics of forgiveness. But let's begin with the first half of this prayer request. Forgive us this day, I mean, forgive us for our, our trespasses, or forgive us our debts. Now, why would that be controversial? Forgive us our debts. God, every day I'm going to pray, God, please forgive me. 
for my sins. Why would that be controversial? Well, this is how that is controversial in the minds of Christians. The question is raised, why, if we're justified and we're cleansed of all of our sins through the blood of Jesus Christ, in that act of justification, why then must we go on to ask for forgiveness? Now you might say, well, that's kind of a dumb question. And the answer, then, and I'd like to say, no, that's actually a very intelligent question. Because think about it. This person is actually wrestling with the doctrine of justification. What is the doctrine of justification? It is the fact that I stand guilty before the courtroom of heaven because of all of my sins. But Jesus Christ becomes my substitute. And therefore, although I have been sentenced to death because of my sins, Jesus Christ dies in my place. God takes all of my sin and lays it upon Jesus. And God takes all of Jesus' righteousness and lays it upon me. Declares Jesus the sinner. Declares me the righteous person. Crucifies Jesus with my sin. And then pardons me of all of my sin forever and ever and ever. Now, why then, if I sin, do I have to continually ask for forgiveness? If the supreme judge of the universe is completely satisfied and he has pardoned me, why do I have to ask for forgiveness? Well, the answer to that is, is because you have a relationship with God that has many different dimensions. Okay? First of all, you do have a legal relationship with God. God is the master and judge of the universe. We have sinned against him. And Jesus Christ completely answers the legal relationship that we have with God. Completely. If you are here today and you are in Christ Jesus, all of your sins are forgiven. And all of the sins that you ever commit will be forgiven in Christ Jesus based on this justification. You right now sit justified before God. But you have another relationship with God. There's another dimension in your relationship with God. And that is that God is your Father. And therefore you have a relationship with Him in that sense, which in one sense you can say is different from your relationship with Him as a judge. As a judge, he's totally satisfied. Case closed. Files put away. But as a father, you continue to live with him day in and day out. And when we sin, it affects our relationship with him as father. It affects our relationship. It's the same thing in a parent-child relationship. When a child sins against a parent, that doesn't affect the legal relationship that exists between the father and his son. If the, if the son does something and he sins against his father, that doesn't affect the legal relationship. He doesn't walk down the hall and say, hey, who are you and what are you doing in my house? He said, well, I'm your son. What do you mean? He said, no, 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 no. Remember you sinning against me? I don't even know. I don't recognize that legal relationship anymore. Get your stuff and get out. You're no longer my son. No, it doesn't affect the relationship in that way. Legally. Just like our sins do not affect the legal standing that we 
have in our justification. But it does affect the emotional, relational aspect of the father-son relationship. Okay? He may still legally be a son, and the father may even recognize that. But the father may be upset. Or he may be
our relationship is once again restored. We're going to talk a little bit more about that tonight. But let's go on to the next controversy. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Now this is actually much more controversial. Because some people think that this sounds like legalism. It sounds like work. Now when I was back in 1974, which is ancient history for some of you, when I showed up in Philadelphia College of Bible, I sat down to take a class in Matthew. And I didn't realize I was so unaware of, of theological issues that were out there. I just loved the Bible, loved the Lord. He had saved me out of some wretched sin, and I just loved him, and I wanted to know the Bible. Well, I sat down in this class, and I didn't, I didn't know what dispensationalism was, and I didn't know what premillennialism was. I didn't know any of that stuff. But what happened was, is the guy was teaching through the book of Matthew, when he got to the Lord's Prayer and he got to this, he said, this is why the Lord's Prayer is not a Christian prayer. This prayer is not to be prayed by Christians. And I looked at him and I knew enough Bible to know he's dead wrong. Oh no, this prayer, see, this is legalism. This is legalism. This might be in the way that he is dealing with you. 
God to operate any other way. Think of a parent. You parents, many times you've done this. You've given your child something. Maybe you've given your child a bag of M&M's. Okay, so you've got this whole bag of M&M's. And you say, here, here. So, 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 I'm, 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 here, here's this bag of M&M's. I did this because I'm such a nice And he walks down into the living room, and there's all of his other brothers. He says, hey, give me some, give me some. He says, no, 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 these are my eminence. And you say, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. I gave those to you out of the graciousness of my heart. Now, you should then go and share with your brothers and sisters. No parent says, good boy, way to go, man. And I'll give you some more because. Now that leads us 
to the parable that God taught in Matthew, at Jesus taught in Matthew 18. And I want you to turn to that. We're going to take a few minutes and look at this parable. Very, very powerful, powerful parable. Peter asks, he feels real generous that day. Peter says, how often should my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times, and you can sense the other disciples said, whoa, whoa. He really, he wants to be like Pope or something someday, man. He, seven times? And that was really actually considered the extreme level in which any Hebrew would forgive somebody seven times. So Peter was really, he was big, macho forgiver here. He said, up to seven times? And the Lord said, I didn't have to say seven times. You heard seven times or somebody else. You didn't hear from me. I'm telling you, seventy times seven. So then all, nobody was impressed with Peter at that point. They were all kind of like, wow. And then Jesus told this, this story. He said that there was certain king. Now that's And he decided to check the books out. It's just things just didn't seem to be looking right. You know, he, he put it in his card and he punched out, you want your balance? Yeah, I want a balance here. You want a receipt? Yeah, I want a receipt. He pulls out, he looks at the balance, the balance doesn't seem to be doing right. And so he goes back and he says, I want a total accounting of what's going on in this kingdom. A total accounting. And so a servant gets brought before him, and this servant, you'll notice what it says here, he, verse 23, who wanted to settle accounts with his servant, and when he began to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now Jesus is telling the story. 10,000 talents. Now that means nothing to you, right? 10,000 talents. What's a talent? I thought that was the ability to tap dance or something. What is a talent? A talent back in Jesus' day was actually a sum of money. A sum of money. Now let me do some math for you to help you understand Jesus' parable here. One talent, just one talent, equals... 6,000 denarii. You say, Todd, that was very helpful. Thank you for sharing that with us. No, that wasn't helpful, was it? Because you don't know what a denarii is. Well, listen. A denarii, one denarii, okay, one talent equals 6,000 denarii. One denarii was how much a labor made for one day's work. Now, back then, it was usually 12 hours, we know from another parable that Jesus told. A denarii was what one labor made for one day's work. Now, let's figure out how much this guy owed just in terms of hours to work to pay him back. If one talent is 6,000 denarii, one denarii is how much they should work one day. To pay back one talent at six days a week, the guy would have to work a thousand weeks, which is 19.2 years. Now, in order to pay back 10,000 talents, which is what he owes, he is going to have to work 192 thousand years to pay off his debt. Okay? You get the idea? Jesus has, has said this is an unbelievably high figure. Okay? Let's do it in money. Let's just go really easy. Let's 
let's say a denarii is 80 bucks, $10 an hour, 80 bucks. Okay, and denarii then being 80 bucks, 6,000 of those, or one talent, is $480,000. But this guy doesn't owe one talent, does he? He doesn't owe $480,000. He owes 10,000 talents, which is $4 billion, $800 million. You say, how in the world could a guy get in debt for $4 billion, $800 million? We have to realize he was working for a kid. And this guy was sort of like the secretary of the treasury or or something like that. He was using government money. And he messed up that much. And all of a sudden they came to his department and they said, lo and behold, your department is $4,800,000. billion I hope this doesn't offend anybody, but you think this guy works for gun registry or something like that, huh? He just he's like, where's the money? Like, where's the money out there? It's gone. And that's what this guy did. And so all of a sudden, he comes and he stands before the king. And what does the king say? The king says, you owe me this money. He says, can work for you. And that guy says, believe it or not, the guy says, I'll pay you back. I'll work for you and I'll pay you back. Now why does he say that? Well he says that because the king says this. Okay, listen, this is what I'm gonna do. You make good money because you work for the government and I have a sneaking suspicion that some of that money is why you have a nice swimming pool and all that. I'm selling all of your house Everything that you've got, liquidating all of your assets, and I'm going to take that in. Then I'm selling you as a slave, and I'm going to take whatever I get for you as a slave, and then I'm selling your wife as a slave, and then I'm lining up every single one of your children on the slave market, and I'm selling them to different homes. So you're
watching it, 3% interest. And this king is saying, I'm willing to take the loss of all of that and forget it all. Go home to your wife, go home to your children. Don't worry about it. Well, this character didn't go home. He didn't go home. What he did was, Jesus said this, he went walking out of there, and notice what it says. It says, but that servant, verse 28, went out and found one of his fellow servants. This guy actually goes on a hunt like a predator looking around. Now, maybe this guy worked in the, in the, in the department that he was responsible for. Me. 
major life event. And he said, you know what this impacted you like? This impacted you like a car hitting a mosquito. It meant nothing to you that I forgave you $4.8 billion. It meant nothing to you. And you just got up and you lived your same old miserable life and you treated people just as miserable as you were. Not only are you responsible, not only are you covetous, not only are you a liar, keeping this money away from me for so long, but you are an unforgiving person. You hold and save every single penny of it and pay the guy back. How is he going to pay back $4.8 billion? How's he going to do it? And the answer, of course, is he's not. He's going to be punished for that cost. Notice Jesus' last line, the application. So, So will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. God expects you and I. So let me ask you, by way of application, and I ask 
myself. Are you and I forgiving people? Are you a forgiving person? Is that part of your nature? Are you forgiving? Are, are you the kind of person who forgives easily and from the heart? You let things go. You give people slack. What happens when somebody cuts you off when you're driving? I saw some eyes turn in. Why did you say that? What happens when people take your parking spot? You pull in, get your directional signal on everything else in this. You know, this car comes in. For me, it's usually very young people or old ladies. And I'm much more easier on the old ladies when it's the guy with boom, 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 boom. He comes around on two wheels and pulls into my parking spot that I've patiently been waiting while the other person gets out. How forgiving are how, we? How, how willing to forgive are we? What about the Serious stuff. People hurt you. People say mean things about you. People rip you off. How forgiving are we? Are we forgiving people or are we unforgiving people? Are we people who hold grudges? People who keep very careful records of who stabbed us in the back? Can you right now go to some, some computer database in your brain and pull up the files of people who perhaps even years ago did you wrong? You still got that file in there? You still have it? Are we mean, spirited? Are we vengeful? Are we people who forgive, but we won't forget? We won't forget. Well, this is a sign of how much we really understand, or how much we have really been impacted by the grace of God in our lives. This will tell you whether it's what Jesus did on the cross means to you, the, the, the density weight of a mosquito or a plowing into a bubble. It's going to tell you how much what Jesus actually did This is a sign. We can sing all we want. We can have wonderful voices and sing praises. And, and Craig put something up here and we could just sing. And, and our voices could harmonize very well. And we could be very nice people. We could memorize our Bible. But the, one of the real key signs as to whether any of this means anything to us. What happens when somebody else hurts us? Whether we are able to forgive them or not. Whether our hearts are willing to open up or not. And the reason why this is such a key issue for us is because it tells us how much we value what has been done. See what this guy was supposed to do. He was supposed to walk out of the king's throne room, hug his wife, hug his children, and say, oh, kids, I've been such a terrible father and such a terrible husband, and I've I ripped, yeah, I, I, I ripped some of this money off, and, and I'm going to repent and be different. And I was so consumed about money, and I'm going to be a different person now. I'm just going to, I'm just so thankful that I've been forgiven. And then 
the guy comes walking down the hallway. See, he's walking with his family. The guy comes walking down the hallway and gives him 8,000 bucks. So he knows this guy's a miserable old, old coot. So as soon as he sees him, he dodges behind the, the water pool. And the guy walks up to him and taps him. He says, you know, what you pay for it. Remember that? 8,000 bucks. So forget it, man. It's just money. Why should you let money come between us? Forget it. No, 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 I'll pay you back. No, you don't have to pay me back. Forget it. You, you, you're a hardworking guy. You've got other bills. Just forget it. I totally forgive you. Hey, let's have lunch next week. God, I can't believe this guy. He's a totally different person. He was supposed to be a totally different person. He was he was
cleansed. Jesus getting nothing for it, but giving everything for it. This king, when that man left, this king was what? He was compassionate. And he was $4.8 billion poor. Jesus laying on, hanging on the cross. What did he get for it? Nothing. He just gave to me and gave. He took my debt. I sin. He gets beaten. I sin. He gets nailed. I'm selfish and mean spirited. He gets. change and soften our hearts so that the unforgiveness that we have toward this neighbor or toward this employee or toward this person who ripped me off for this, those leeches should begin to fall off as we think of what Christ has done for us so that we can do what the scripture says. Ephesians 4.32 Kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Colossians 3 13, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you. So you also must forgive. Are there people in your life that you need to forgive? We're told daily to clear out our relationship with God and our relationship with each other. Pray this prayer daily. Forgive me of my God, I forgive other people. Forgive me, and I forgive. And let me just take our few last closing minutes to speak to those here who do not know Christ. And I just simply want to say this. I want to talk to you just for a few minutes about the biggest problem in your life. And then I want to give you the best news in the world biggest problem in your life is fill in the blank. What's the biggest problem in your life? Now sit there and think about it. Okay, the biggest problem in my life. Uh, I don't have enough money, or I don't have a job, or I don't have a wife, or I don't have this, or I don't have that. That's the biggest problem in my life. No, that's not. It's a problem, but it's not the biggest problem in your life is God. God's the biggest problem you got in your life. You say, you're not a very nice pastor. That's not what you're supposed to say. You're supposed to say, God's the biggest help in my life. No, I am being a nice pastor. God is the biggest problem you've got in your life. Why? Because God is your judge. God is your judge. And a judge's job is not to forgive. That's not the judge's job. A judge's job is not to forgive. Can you imagine? You go in there, somebody rips you off for a million bucks. You take it to court, and the judge starts weeping when the guy says, Yeah, well, you know, it was so hard for me to pay my bills, and my wife was always nagging, so yeah, she stole a million bucks off the top. And I'm sitting there, and the judge starts crying. And the judge says, I forgive you. You say, wait a minute. I didn't forgive you. Wait a minute. That's my money here. A judge's job is not to forgive. A judge's job. 
job is to uphold the law. A judge's job is to dispense justice. A judge's job is to see that the offender is punished. That's what a judge's job is. Now, I think it's a humorous one, but let's do one that isn't humorous. Imagine that somebody takes and kidnaps your little girl and murders her. And the judge standing there feels sorry for this guy because And he gets all compassionate about it. He says, hey, listen, you know, you messed up once. Try not to do it again. He forgives you. You say, where is justice here? This is not your job. Your job is to bring justice to this case. God is our judge. And unbeliever, your biggest problem in life is God. Because God is judge, and he has been watching you very closely. Have you ever had people watching you, and they start watching you, say, what are you doing? What are you doing? I'll have kids in my own family say, he's watching me. They don't like it. He's just looking at me. Go look away. Go somewhere else. Do this. Do you, doesn't it drive you nuts if people are watching you? Do you ever be in a store and tell me something? He sees everything you do. He can actually look in your brain and see what you're thinking. He can look in your heart and see what your motives are. And God sees everything and he remembers everything. Why? Because God has infinite intelligence. Infinite. That means God is smarter than anything that you can even imagine. God remembers, sees everything, and remembers everything with his infinite intelligence. He took the most powerful computers together and multiplied it billions of times. You're not even close. You got one, maybe one half of a cell in God's brain. God knows so much. In fact, right now, I could ask God, God, how many hairs were on my head in June 29, 1963? God can give you the exact answer. If I say, God, how many specks of dust were laying on the dashboard of my car on July 7th, 1982 at 10.30 a.m. and God can give you the figure right now. Because God is infinite and he remembers everything and sees everything. And as the judge, therefore, he doesn't need any witnesses. He knows everything. God is perfectly holy. He is pure goodness, pure righteousness. And therefore, he is totally committed to the standard of justice. And that is why God has a place called hell, which is a very ugly, terrible, desperate place where he places people forever and ever Ever, as Jesus told us, the torturers, and therefore they will suffer for their sins, paying off the penalty. He, as a judge, will show no mercy. He is. He will do nothing that will be a front to justice. He won't say yes. the bad news. The biggest problem in the world that the unbeliever has is God. But here's a wonderful twist to that tale. The 
best news in the world is what God has done for us. What God has done for us. God is so faithful to justice. Listen to what he did. Same sinners who couldn't pay for their own sin. And who his justice demanded that they die for those sins. God in his compassion didn't say, I'll just brush him under the rug. No, that would be an affront to his justice. Keeping his perfect justice perfect, God did the only just and right turned to his son and he said, my son, the word, very God, my son, will you die for these people? And will you take their punishment on yourself so that my justice will be intact, your justice Jesus said yes. And you see, this is what the cross is all about. The cross is about God's ability to provide us with forgiveness and yet still be just. He punishes Jesus and he extends the hand of forgiveness to us. And right now, if you are an unbeliever and you're here, here's the best news in the world for you. God is offering to take away every single one of your sins. God is offering to wash them completely away. God is offering, and I don't care how bad you've been. You might have murdered people. You might have murdered people. God saved murderers before. Moses was a murderer. God saved him. God has saved murderers before. David was a murderer. God has saved him. You may have committed adultery. You may have committed rape. You may have been, you may be a terrible thief, an awful liar. You may be the most awful person walking on the face of the earth. But God is able to save you and to take away every single one of your sins. Why? Because of his son and what his son has done. God is a God who is full of compassion. And here's the best news in the world. There's a door open for sinners. There's a door wide open that you can come and you can find salvation. God's arms are wide open. Today is the day of salvation and God is saying, come to me. Come to me and I'll forgive you of all of your sins. I'll cancel out your debt. You owe me 10,000 talents. You'll never be able to pay me I'll rip up the dead. I'll nail it to Jesus' cross. I'll drench it in his blood. I'll remember it no more. I offer to do this for you. Now be careful here. Don't take God as a fool. The Bible says God cannot be mocked. Don't come traipsing toward God and say, oh, Sounds great. Because I've done some really bad stuff. And you know, I'm planning on doing a whole lot more bad stuff in the future here. But hey, I want to go to heaven. So I'll just know you can't play games with God like that. You have to say, God, listen. I want your free gift.
gift that you offer me. And I'm willing to, to repent. That's what it means. Put this stuff aside. And I'm willing to, to do things your way. Because I don't want to go to hell. I want you. I want salvation. And if you pray that from the heart to God, God's answer to you, no matter how wicked you are, God's answer with you will be this. Then come on. Come here. I'll make you my child. I'll forgive you. God won't say, oh, no, wait a minute. You're really bad. You're really bad. No, 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 no. He loves to save sinners. The worst better in one sense because it gives him more glory of how gracious and kind he is. And he'll say, come on. I'll forgive you of all of your sins. I'll make heaven your home. I'll make sure you never go to hell. I'll give you happiness in this world and in the world to come. I'll make your life that's the good news. That's the good news. And you know what you'll have? You know what'll happen to you if you're struggling with forgiveness? That'll make you a really good forgiver too. Because after you feel the warm embrace of God's love, it's pretty hard to grab somebody else. God will soften your heart and give you a heart of love. May God work in your life. May you come to him. May you take God seriously. May you find in him that he really is your all. Let's pray again. Father, we want to come to you today and we want to ask you to forgive us of all of our debts. Father, we have sinned against you and we have done things we know that have broken our fellowship with you that has disappointed you that because we thank you that it has not affected our legal standing with you. But Father, we love you and we want the full light of your countenance. We want you to smile upon us. So we ask you to forgive us of our sins. Sins that we have done in this past week. Sins that we may have even done this day. We pray that you would forgive us. And Father, we ask that you will help us and you will forgive those who have sinned against us as well. And give us the grace to forgive them. Father, we pray that you will be with us and you will help us to pray this daily. And Father, I pray for any of them come here today and they've, they've maybe been afraid of dying or afraid of hell or they've just been having a growing sense that they, they weren't right with you or maybe a growing sense that this world just seems kind of empty and lonely and shallow and they want more but they can't find it here. And they, what they realize is they've been looking for you. And you've, in fact, been drawing. Father, I pray that you would grant them forgiveness. I pray that they would come to you even this day and 
find you and find forgiveness. Thank you that you are a great and compassionate and merciful King who has provided a way, and that way being your Son, Jesus, for all of our sins to be forgiven. Help them, I pray, to take you up on this, not to stand out in the outskirts and stay away from you. Draw them to yourself, I pray. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Jesus has paid it all for us, our debt, him 430. Call upon him to lean upon him.